Tiffany Lucas, a 32-year-old mother in Kentucky, has been accused of killing her two young children, ages 6 and 9, inside their Shepherdsville home. The Bullitt County Sheriff's Office arrested Lucas and charged her with two counts of murder after responding to a shooting report at the residence. A witness found the children in a bedroom with gunshot wounds, and a gun believed to be the murder weapon was discovered on a bed. The children were taken to a local hospital, but died shortly afterward. The investigation is ongoing, and authorities have not released further details about the incident. Tiffany Lucas has a previous conviction for drug possession, resulting in a one-month jail sentence. The motive for the alleged crime remains unclear, with authorities mentioning possibilities such as mental illness. Lucas is currently held at the Bullitt County Detention Center on a $2 million bond. A judge entered a not guilty plea on her behalf. The community is left in shock and sadness over the horrifying incident. Would you think that finding a missing person's severed foot meant that they are dead? I was not expecting this case to have so many twists and turns. Melissa Caddick was a 49-year-old woman who grew up in Sydney. Interestingly, Melissa worked as a financial advisor but stated fake qualifications on her CV. In 1998, she was found to have stolen around 2,000 Australian dollars from the company she was working for. She did this by forging her boss's signature and then left voluntarily from the company. She lived a very lavish lifestyle which raised eyebrows among her peers. No one really knew how she could fund the lifestyle she was living. It's alleged that she concocted various stories to explain her wealth to her friends. Her first husband was Tony Caddick from England. The pair had a son together and they moved to Essex in the UK in 2010. Eventually, Melissa got bored of the area and told Tony she was going to Switzerland on a work trip. In actual fact, she had gone to Paris to meet with a man. This man was Anthony Coletti, her hairdresser from Sydney. Tony eventually discovered that the pair were having an affair. After Tony confronted Melissa, she moved back to Sydney with her son in 2012. Again concocting another story, she told her loved ones that she'd split with Tony due to him being abusive, which was not the case. They divorced in 2013 and she married Anthony the same year. Now between 2012 and 2020, it's believed Melissa was involved in kind of a pyramid scheme. She reportedly gained millions of dollars primarily from her friends and family. She bought luxury cars, properties and clothes. The Australian Federal Police even raided her home on the 11th of November 2020. She was in legal trouble and was being investigated. The day after, she vanished. Her son was 14 at the time and he stated he heard a door shutting at around 5.30am. He said he presumed that his mum was going for a run. However, she had left behind all of her possessions, including her mobile phone, which was obviously very concerning. Despite this, strangely, it took her husband 28 hours to phone police. Now, officers reported that Anthony showed a, quote, composed, relaxed and seemingly uncaring persona, unlike any other person I had taken a missing person report from previously. Frustratingly, the CCTV around the area didn't actually capture the direct area that Melissa had vanished from. Bizarrely, it seemed that Melissa had been fearing for her safety. A friend claimed that Melissa made her write down a four-letter code that she was instructed to give her brother if she went missing. In another shocking twist, on the 21st of February 2021, a shoe containing a decomposed human foot was discovered washed up on Bonda Beach. The shoe matched the size and the description of the shoes she was seen wearing during the raid of her home. DNA tests confirmed the foot was hers. However, criminologists were very quick to point out the fact that just because her foot was found, it didn't mean she was dead. She may have been captured and had it amputated, or she may have even amputated her foot herself. It could have been a way for her to evade police capture. Now, some people claimed that they believe she may have taken her own life on the day she was vanished. However, an expert report called that into question. By examining barnacle growth on the shoe, they found that it had spent no more than a week in the water. Now remember that the shoe was found with the foot inside in February and she had vanished in November. In December 2022, she was declared legally dead. Her husband still denies having anything to do with her disappearance. On May 11th, 2022, Anna Mariah Wilson, a pro cyclist, was found dead just days before a big race she was favored to win. 
Wilson was found shot in the head and in the chest by a friend she was staying with in Austin, Texas. The accused killer, Caitlin Armstrong, who also has ties to the cycling world, is now on trial for Wilson's murder. Armstrong had a long time on and off relationship with another pro cyclist, Colin Strickland. While the two were separated, Strickland briefly dated Wilson, with whom he remained friendly. After the murder, Strickland told police he had picked up Wilson earlier that day and the two had gone for a swim at a local public pool. He said he dropped her off at around 8.30 p.m. Prosecutors allege that Armstrong had been tracking the pair using the popular fitness app Strava, where Wilson logged her workouts. Later that evening, Wilson's friend, Caitlin Cash, returned to her apartment and found Wilson dead on the bathroom floor. She had been shot in the head and chest. Prosecutors told the jury that Armstrong's Jeep had been seen near the apartment where Wilson had been staying. But Armstrong's attorney said there is no video evidence putting Armstrong at the scene. In the aftermath of Wilson's killing, police questioned Armstrong and let her go. Before they issued an arrest warrant, authorities said Armstrong fled to Costa Rica. Authorities said she taught yoga and had plastic surgery to change her appearance. Prosecutors say she also cut and colored her hair. After nearly six weeks, Armstrong was arrested by U.S. Marshals at a hostel in Costa Rica. Three weeks before her trial on October 11th, Armstrong allegedly tried to escape police custody by running away from officers transporting her to a doctor's appointment. Authorities said she never left the officer's site and only made it about half a block. Armstrong has pleaded not guilty to a charge of first degree murder, but she faces 99 years in prison if convicted. The case of the Dardeen family was one that was deemed too gruesome for news stations and daytime television shows such as Oprah, and to this day, nearly 25 years later, it still remains unsolved. The family consisted of 29-year-old Russell Keith, wife Ruby Elaine, who was 30 and 7 months pregnant at the time, and their 3-year-old son, who they had named Peter. The growing family had recently moved to the small town of Ina, Illinois in 1986 and were living in a rented-out trailer near Route 37. And though this was a small town, it did not have a reputation for being the safest. During the past two years, this small town had experienced 15 homicides, including that of a 10-year-old girl that had recently been murdered in the area. This had left everyone in the town, including the Dardines, on edge, and in fact, when a woman had approached the trailer asking for help one night, Keith would flat out deny her and ask her to leave the property. The family had felt so unsafe here that Keith had told his mother, Joanne Dardine, that regardless if he had a job lined up or not, he and the family would be moving out of the small town by the end of the year. But then came the night of November 17th, 1987. Keith, who had always been described as a reliable worker, had failed to show up to work that night, and after workers and family had failed to reach either him or Elaine, they decided to contact the police. Keith's father had agreed to meet with officials at the Dardine residence, unaware of the horrors that they were about to discover. There is a major trigger warning for the rest of this episode, but once Keith's father and officials had made their way into the household, they would discover three bodies that were tucked inside Keith and Elaine's bed. The bodies had belonged to that of Elaine, their three-year-old son Peter, and the newborn infant that Elaine had given birth to during the attack. All had been found deceased in the bed. Keith's body was nowhere to be found within the house, and much to the shock of the family, this led investigators to believe him to be the prime suspect in this case, but that theory would be put to rest when just the very next day, a group of hunters would find Keith Dardine's body about a mile away from their trailer. He had been found, shot three times, and then sexually mutilated. His car would also later be found right in front of the police department in that town. The town immediately began to swirl with rumors as over 30 detectives had to chase down over 1,000 leads, but unfortunately those leads really came to nothing. There was no sign of an affair, drug use or drug selling, or any type of gambling debt that the family could have had, and this went on for years until one solid lead came up, which I'll have to make in a part two. Which truth is that? Knowledge is power. Power. It's power. Seize him. Cut his throat. Stop. Let him go. Step back three paces. Turn around. Close your eyes. Mommy told me something a little girl should know. It's all about. 
masked woman in Japan asks you if she's beautiful, be careful how you respond. It could be Kuchi Sakeona. Some people call her the slit mouth woman. She was abused and mutilated during her lifetime. It's said that her husband cut a smile on his face from ear to ear. She now haunts the streets of Japan wearing a mask and rusty scissors, asking people one question, if they think she's beautiful or not. You think I'm beautiful? Yeah. still think I'm beautiful? What happened to you? Comment down below, smash or pass? By the way, a lot of y'all keep asking how's Gizmo? He is 14 years old now. Let's give him a biggie. Oh, you like the biggie? If you encounter her, please be careful how you answer her question. If you say yes, she'll take her mask off and ask you again. And if you say yes one more time, she'll cut you a smile on your face just like hers. Oh, and if you say no, she'll unalive you right there and then. So what do you do? How do you survive? A thousand IQ right here. Tell her she aight. I mean, girl, you aight. You know what I'm saying? You cool. Like, I smash, but... Can we put a bag over your face? The other way to survive is to throw money at her. Which she'll stop the pickup, giving you enough time to run away. My lord, this smoothie is unequivocally f***ing bossing. <laughs> Welcome back to our YouTube channel. After day three, day three after <laughs> morning something. Wow! Put that on the camera. It was worth it. Um, and we had sex a lot. The full video and transcript of the video that I just showed you is incredibly disturbing. Yes, you heard what they said correctly. This 18-year-old named Aaron Guerrero said murdering somebody was worth it. But who did this teenage couple just murder together? Well, it was none other than 16-year-old Sierra Halseth's father, Daniel Halseth. So at the time, Sierra was living with her father, Daniel. Daniel seemed like your everyday father. He prioritized fitness, he posted frequently on social media, and his posts frequently involved his family, including his 16-year-old daughter, Sierra. Now before the murder happened, Sierra's parents, Daniel and Elizabeth, had gone through a bitter divorce. In October of 2011, Daniel was assaulted for open and gross lewdness after his wife said he assaulted her. Then there were allegations that Elizabeth had been cheating on Daniel and obviously they just had a terrible marriage. But at some point along the way, 16-year-old Sierra crossed paths with 18-year-old Aaron Guerrero and the young couple quickly fell in love. So at some point, Sierra told Aaron that her father, Daniel, was abusive towards her, both physically and sexually. And according to the two of them, they felt like the only way to make this right was to murder Sierra's blood father. So in April of 2021, the two came up with a plan. I should also add in here that Aaron and Sierra had dated in 2020 before both of their parents had separated them and said they were bad for each other. They had also learned that the two were planning on running off to Los Angeles together, and since Sierra was only 16 at the time, obviously her dad said no. So the day before Daniel's body was found, Aaron ran away from home and disappeared. And the two teenagers then purchased a circular saw, saw blades, bleach, lighter fluid, disposable gloves, and a drop cloth from a local hardware store. Now, Aaron claims that he carried out this murder because he was on LSD at the time of the murder, but I've never seen that actually proven. So on that day in April of 2021, Sierra and Aaron entered the Halseth home. They then stabbed Daniel Halseth 70 times. They cut his body up, they set fire to it, and they attempted to burn down his house. And at one point shortly afterwards, a woman named Peggy and her friend entered Daniel's home and noticed that his front door was open. They then smelled smoke and noticed a large burned patch on the living room floor. Afterwards, they entered the garage and noticed the smell of lighter fluid. They also saw a sleeping bag on the floor, and when they opened up the sleeping bag, they saw the charred and mutilated remains of Daniel Halseth. So Sierra and Aaron then stole Daniel's car and went on the run, and they were eventually arrested in Salt Lake City, Utah, just a few days after killing Sierra's dad. And it was three days after the murder when they made that disturbing video where they giggle and laugh about murdering Daniel. So eventually, after a lengthy trial and all these details became public, Sierra and Aaron were sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 22 years. So they are in prison now, and I think that video remains one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen. The complete lack of empathy and the almost cheeriness, happiness that they both have within them, even after murdering Sierra's father.
This is the inside of the home where four University of Idaho students were brutally murdered. The crime scene has been preserved for more than two weeks now as investigators sifted through every single inch of this three-story home looking for clues. Daily Mail has obtained exclusive photos of the site of this quadruple homicide and the house really just looks frozen in time. The off-campus residence has been described as a party house and by all accounts that's exactly what it looked like the night of these brutal murders. There are red solo cups set up for a beer pong game, an empty bag of popcorn, dirty dishes, a half drank iced coffee. Honestly, it's all a bit of a mess, but that's exactly what you would expect to find in an off-campus house with five college students living in it on a Saturday night. Now, if you focus right here, you see a red little piece of tape. That's an evidence marker, and those are scattered all throughout the house. So far, 113 pieces of physical evidence have been taken by investigators. What's also interesting here is what we don't see, which is blood. Based on early photos of the house, there was so much blood in one of the bedrooms that it was literally seeping out of the home through the foundation. But based on the images of these common living spaces, there really doesn't seem to be anything there that would have indicated this very brutal crime. Do not let your kids around the water in New Mexico. Hello, my name is La Llorona. I was once a beautiful woman in Mexico, and I was married to a Spanish man and had two kids. My husband traveled for work, but always came back to visit. Until one day his visit stopped altogether. I was heartbroken and angry to get back at him for leaving us. I decided to drown our two kids in the river. When I came back to my senses, it was too late. I spent every day crying and mourning for my children. I couldn't stand the pain, so I threw myself into the river. But even though I pass, I am still stuck on the earth, still looking for my children today. You might hear me say, If you hear me calling, stay as far away as possible. I might confuse you as my child and snatch you and drag you into the river so you can be with me. There's a horrific murder case that's happening right now out of Arizona that's still unsolved. Let's talk about what happened to Mercedes Vega. On April 16th of this year, Mercedes was abducted from the parking garage of her Tempe, Arizona apartment and brutally killed. That night, security footage shows her walking into her apartment's parking garage a little after 9pm. She was on her way to meet her friends and have a fun night at Dave & Buster's, but in this footage, she had no idea what was about to happen to her. Some time before making it to her car, she was attacked and taken by at least two people, and the details that follow are still a mystery. A little after 1 a.m. the next morning, the Department of Public Safety was called in to investigate a car that was on fire along the side of Interstate 10 in Tonopah. Upon arriving to the scene, they found Mercedes' burned body in the back seat, and she was deceased. In the last few hours of her life, she was tortured, and according to the medical examiner, she had been shot in the arm, had blunt force trauma to her head, and had traces of bleach in her throat. But all of this did not kill her. She ultimately died from smoke inhalation while being burned alive in that car. Investigators also found gloves and bleach in the front seat and lighter fluid in the back, but there are still a ton of questions that remain in this case, and nothing about this makes any sense. The car that Mercedes was found in was not her car. Her car, which was a 2019 Dodge Charger, was found abandoned near Mill Avenue in Tempe. She was not burned in her own vehicle, and so far, investigators still don't know who the car she was found in belongs to. One of the big questions in this case is how did her car get from her apartment to where it was found, and who drove the other car to Tonopah? Mercedes' parents believe that this was a targeted attack and that death wasn't the ultimate goal, but that Mercedes fought back which resulted in her death. Her parents mentioned that she danced at a club two nights a week, and many question if her death could possibly be connected back to someone she met while at work. It's now been seven months, and Mercedes' murder is still unsolved. Whoever committed this vicious attack is still out there. Right now, there is a silent witness award of up to $2,000 for information leading to an arrest. But if you'd like to donate to up that reward or to report a tip, please contact the number on the screen. For more information on this case and to show your support, please follow this account that was created for Mercedes that's run by her family. She and her family deserve justice. So 
when you see this girl, what's the first thing that comes to mind? If you said Chilean drug queen pin, you would be 100% right. This is Narco Queen, and she ran a drug dealing gang in Chile that had strong cartel connections. And she also kept it popping on the talk. And the gang that she ran was kind of small, but they were also known to be savage and quick to shoot. Now, they were constantly having back and forth with rival gangs, but people were afraid to tell on them because they were worried about retaliation. But after enough of these incidences, the Chilean police started getting flooded with anonymous tips. Then all of a sudden, Narco Queen disappears off the face of the internet for like three months. And when she finally reappears on TikTok, she's literally making dance videos in prison. So after serving less than a year of prison, she gets out and seemingly she does not go back to her queen pin lifestyle. But within six months, she is driving to the nail salon and her car gets rammed. She gets out of her car and three dudes in ski masks jump out and end her. They take off in her car and blow it up a few miles down the road. And there's no way to know for sure exactly what happened because no one was ever caught, but it was more than likely retribution from her past life catching up with her after she had changed her ways. This is the tongue video explained, a cartel execution video you should never go looking for. Before I begin, you should never go looking for this video. The video that I'm about to explain opens up in a desert area in the middle of the day. The victim is lying on the ground on his stomach with his hands tied behind his back and he is surrounded by five cartel members. The victim also appears to be in his late teens, early 20s, which makes this even more disturbing. Now, this is where the video gets extremely bad. A cartel member enters the shot and is carrying a pair of pliers and a knife. He kneels down next to the victim whose head is being raised by another cartel member. He then places the pliers into the victim's mouth, attempting to grab his tongue, which he eventually does. The killer then takes the knife and begins slicing the victim's tongue. As this is happening, the victim lets out a scream, and to stop the screaming, the cartel member restraining him slaps him in the face extremely hard several times. A piece of the victim's tongue is cut off, and you see blood forming on the ground. Once the victim's tongue has been cut out completely, the cartel member who is restraining him takes his knife out, and it looks like he's about to behead him, but is stopped by his cartel partners. And the cartel member who cut the victim's tongue out enters back into the shot and grabs the victim's right ear and cuts a piece of it off. He then repeats the same process to the victim's left ear. It's presumed that this form of torture is meant to signify his position in the cartel, which were ears as in listening and tongue as in talking too much. After the victim's ears have been cut off, the cartel member restraining him takes his knife and begins slashing at the victim's throat. And after just seconds, the victim is almost decapitated. A puddle of blood forms on the desert ground as the man with the knife tries to sever his spinal cord, which he eventually does. And you can also hear a woman laughing hysterically in the back, and that's when the video concludes. This video is very brutal, and what makes it even worse is the quality of it. It honestly looks like an ISIS video rather than a cartel video, not only because of the quality, but also because how sharp the blades were. I really recommend you don't go searching for this video, it's extremely gut turning and I promise you it's much better to stay curious.